first scripture today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. This is from John chapter 11, verses 38 through 45. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> so th this past Christmas, uh, my brother uh, came and visited uh, me and my, my parents here in St. Louis, and he brought his fiance with him, uh, Diana, who's, who's now his wife. And we had a great time. We got to go uh, skating down at Steinberg Rink. Uh, have you all, all ever been there to the ice skating rink? It's amazing. You get to go skating outside. And we did all kinds of fun things. One night, we uh, stayed up late, and we, we were just talking. And we started to talk about the time that I was in the hospital. And for the first time, uh, my dad told me and my brother that at one point the doctors didn't think that I was going to make it. And it got so bad that my brother, who was in high school, they said, we need to have you come in. You've got to say goodbye to your brother. And we talked about how they would stay kind of gathered around me, and they would pray, and they would massage my hands, and they would just sit there and pray over me. So my family and my brother, like Mary and Martha, they were, they were praying for a miracle. And today's message is the second message in a series that we're doing called Survival Skills. And kind of the focus of the series is for us to look at how can our Christian faith help us to face times of illness and death? How, how does our faith help us to get through these times together? Now, the scriptures that we read today uh, deal with how God is at work healing, you know, communities of people. God is at work, you know, healing countries. God is at work healing the world. And God is, work, God is at work healing us as individuals, healing us as families. Today's message is going to focus specifically on how our faith can help us to respond to sudden near-death illnesses like uh, heart attacks and other major illnesses. Now, I'd like to start by saying that if you've, ever, if you've ever struggled with your faith whenever you've come close to death, then you're not alone. Both of the scriptures that we read today dive in to this struggle with us, and they, they wrestle with faith and understanding, uh, asking questions of God such as, where were you, God, when we needed you? And why didn't you come when we called? How could you allow this to happen to us? Now, our passage from Isaiah 40 was written during a very dark time in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, the Jews had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire and captured, and now they were taken and they were living in exile in a foreign land. Um, in Babylon, if you're thinking about where that would be on the map today, it'd be Iraq and Syria and Iran, that part of the world. 
And so like the Africans who were taken into slavery in the 17th and the 18th and 19th century, just imagine that. The Jewish people were living somewhere forced against their will in another land. And what made this especially hard for the Jewish people is that they had been promised by God that God was always going to be there with them. Does that sound familiar? God had promised the people of Israel in 2 Samuel 7, 19, that they would always be protected, that there would always be a king on the throne of David. But the Babylonians came, and the king of Judea fled, and he was captured, and then all of the Jewish people were conquered and taken into exile in Babylon. And understandably, many Jews, after this incredible event, they gave up their faith, just abandoned it completely. They couldn't understand why God would allow this to happen to them. Only a few, only a remnant remained faithful to God. They kept praying, and they stayed in community with each other. They didn't understand exactly what was going on, and they had questions and they had doubts, but they stayed faithful in community together. They asked questions of faith, saying, God, why why did you let this happen? Where were you when we needed you? Why didn't you come when we called? How could you allow this to happen? Now, this Old Testament text focused on God's healing of nations and, and big groups of people. It has a sister text in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, Martha asks Jesus the very, very similar questions. She says, Jesus, where were you when we needed you? And why didn't you come whenever we called? How could you allow this to happen to my brother, to Lazarus? I can already smell the stench of death. Don't, don't roll away the stone. It's too late. You can't possibly bring it back now. Now, the first thing that strikes me about this story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is the incredible sadness and the pain that Jesus feels whenever he is talking with this family. Jesus wept. He hates what's happened to Lazarus. He loves Lazarus, and he's right there feeling that pain with that family. You see, God isn't detached and off out there somewhere. God is is right there with us. These details of the the vivid pain and suffering that Jesus goes through in the story, it shows me that God shares our suffering with us. Our pain is real, and God takes our pain and our death very seriously. So I want you to imagine a minute that there is this huge crowd of people gathered around Jesus and Martha. Uh, Look around. You see how we got this big crowd of people here in the sanctuary? This many people were gathered there, and everyone is just crying. They, they just can't believe what has happened to Lazarus. This is such a tragedy that he's died. And they all look to Jesus. They want to believe. Can he do it? Can Jesus really raise Lazarus from the dead? Well, let me tell you a story. So about 10 years ago, um, I went with my family uh, to Portland, Oregon, and I don't know if you've ever been there before, but it's, it's a beautiful place. I mean, it's so green and, and lush, and uh, we were there for my uncle's wedding, and they, they had a wonderful uh, wedding service, and it was uh, with these big windows, kind of like the windows we have, you could see the trees behind it, and uh, right after that wedding service, I got very sick, and I had to be taken to the hospital. And this was really a problem because I was supposed to help uh, host the karaoke party afterwards at the reception <laughs> with my brother, actually. He, he did a great job without me. But, uh, man, I'd gotten sick, and I, w- I was in the hospital. And um, it turned out that I had gotten mononucleosis, uh, the kissing disease. <laughs> yes. Uh, I call this time in my life BK, before I met my wife, Catherine. So... <laughs> <laughs> But just as a word of warning, um, you know, it's a really, really harsh uh, virus. It um, really makes you tired. It attacks your immune system. And so uh, one of the things that happens is your spleen, to kind of fight this off, will, it kind of enlarges because it's working so hard to, to protect you. And what happened to me is my spleen ruptured, and then I had a lot of internal bleeding. And, um, you know, things just kind of cycled, and 
I spent about three weeks in the hospital, most of the time in a coma, just, just not aware of anything that was going on. I don't remember much from this time, but I do remember a few details. I remember that my family was gathered around me. I have, I have memories of that in, in that in that haze uh, of them holding my hands and, and praying for me. I have memories of the doctors and the nurses, uh, you know, wor working with me and, and helping, helping me to heal. And I remember the incredible presence of God, uh, that, that just love, that closeness, working to heal me. And uh, so after all this time of delirium, I woke up. And who was around me? But my, my parents were there, and my brother was there. And he was holding this boombox, and he was playing the song, I Believe in Miracles. Do you know that one? <laughs> kind of dancing around the room. So my, cl my close brush with death, it really changed my life. It, it changed my life in ways that I'll never even know. Changed the direction of it. Changed the, the direction of the life of my family. Um, while I was lying in that hospital bed, recovering, I felt that closeness of God, and I felt a clarity about the importance of my relationships with other people. That was, that was so strong. I, you know, I have to admit that before I got sick, I, I think I was a little bit selfish of a person. Um, but being sick, it really made me realize the importance of loving uh, my family and my friends, treating them well, focusing on God. It humbled me. And although it would be years until I felt a call to ministry, when I look back on my life, it was lying in that hospital bed that God started to speak to my heart. So in Babylon, God spoke through a prophet to the Jewish people, and God spoke a message of hope and encouragement. You see, even though they were living in exile, God had not forgotten them, and God would restore them to freedom, and to justice. Even the power of the strongest empire in the world, the Babylonian Empire, so strong then, I mean, you probably don't even know about it now. God is the most powerful in the world. And prophet, the prophet uh, of Isaiah 40 tells his people that God did not punish them. He's not going to punish them. He's not going to tempt us. And God is not going to make us sick. In fact, our God is always working to heal us individually, but God is working to heal our whole world, to heal us as a nation. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. You see, the power of humans even the most powerful of empires, it's, it's nothing compared to the absolute power of God. Now, God doesn't always work on our own timetable or on our preferences. And in fact, for the Jewish people in Babylon, they were in exile for over 40 years. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, uh, I don't know if, if you've ever traveled a little bit, whenever you're far from home, you kind of want to get back. But they were there for, for 40 years, held against their will. I mean, some, most of them died whenever they were in captivity in Babylon. Many of them were born in Babylon and didn't even know what Judea was. All that time in exile, half of a lifetime in captivity. And then the amazing happened. Suddenly, the Babylonian Empire just fell apart, and the Jewish people were allowed to return to their homeland. But you know what? They'd been there so long that many people decided just to stay in Babylon, and that's the end of the story that we hear from them. Now, God did not cause this exile, but God did use the time in captivity to shape and to grow the Hebrew people. God shaped their faith and their devotion to justice during their time in captivity. So just imagine, if, if you were being held somewhere against your will, and you'd be saying, you know, whenever we get out, if we ever get out of here, we're going to do things differently. We're going to treat people better. Whenever we're finally in charge of our own destiny again, we are going to do things so much differently than what we're dealing with right now. God shaped their faith, their faith and their devotion to justice during their time of suffering. God used this time to teach the Hebrew people about the healing character of God. You see, God is at work healing our cities, healing our nation, and healing our world. God is molding all of us into a deeper faith and understanding. Now, in Bethany, 
God speaks through the character and the real presence of Jesus Christ. The story of Lazarus shows us that God is with us in our suffering. God really does heal us, and God uses that healing to bring us to faith. When Jesus prays in front of Mary and Martha and that whole crowd of people gathered together, this is the prayer that he offers. He says, God, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. You see, Jesus tells us that God always hears our prayers. God hears our prayers even before you know, they come into our minds. God knows our hearts. And Jesus offers this prayer so that Mary and Martha and that whole crowd of people gathered, they might witness God's healing power, and by witnessing that miracle of healing, that they might believe. Believe that God is always working in our lives to heal us. Believe that God interrupts our lives to bring us to faith in Jesus Christ, and to believe that even death does not separate us from the loving power of God. This is the good news, that God is always with us. And then whenever Jesus says in a loud voice, he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, he stands up and he walks out of the cave and he's still wrapped in the burial cloths. He's still wrapped in a hospital gown. Death, which seemed so absolute, so final, was overcome by the absolute power of Jesus Christ. Like Lazarus, we will all live because of Christ, even though we will die. You see, that's the promise that this, this is not the end of the story, what we're experiencing right now. We live on in Jesus Christ. Now, in the last verse of the story that we read today, it tells us that many of the Jews who saw what Jesus had done, they believed in him. Faith in Jesus Christ, that itself is a healing. Whenever we believe, that we, then we are never alone. When we believe in Jesus Christ, then our lives are transformed. When God is the focus of our lives, then we are truly alive. And I want you to think about this. So, so that crowd of people, they saw this miracle, and they believed in Jesus Christ, and that changed them. And then they told their friends, and then that changed them. And then they told more people, and before you know it, a whole country had been changed. And then before you know it, the whole world transformed by the awesome love of Jesus Christ. The story of Jesus' healing of Lazarus, it, it functions for us on two levels. First, it shows us that God really is with us in our lives, and God is bringing healing into our lives. And second, but most importantly, it affirms that God's healing power is stronger than death. Even though our bodies fail, and someday all of us are going to lie down, God is going to raise all of us up into eternal life. So, you know, God brought the Jews out of captivity in Babylon, and He shaped them into God's people. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and many people believed. And we can live in the hope that although we too will die, God is going to raise us up into new life in Jesus Christ. God is healing the nations of the world. God is healing this community. And God is healing our brothers and our sisters. Now, many of us in this congregation have had or have witnessed sudden near-death experiences, like a heart attack that uh, Dennis spoke about, a car accident, or a sudden illness. And a near-death experience, that is going to shock you to your, to your very core. It's going to shock your faith, your understanding of yourself. It can and it, make, and it should make you question your life. So I want to offer for you some practical suggestions of how we can all support someone who's had a sudden near-death experience. Number one, just spend time with them. I'll always remember um, how when I was recovering at my parents' house in Winsville, a bunch of my friends from college, they came and they visited me over Christmas break. Um, the shock of almost dying is going to give you a really strong desire to connect with your family and with your friends. And so j just spending time with them, that means so much. Uh, whenever someone has come close to death, they need to know that people love them and care for them. Number two, don't assign blame. There will be time to talk about possible changes in lifestyle, maybe quitting smoking or you know, eating better or exercising, things like that. And believe me, if you come close to death, you're going to start to think about, you know, how, can I, how can I live differently? And those doctors, 
they're going to give you plenty of suggestions, right, about how to live differently. So here's what I would suggest, though. For the first three to six months, don't, don't get into trying to figure out what went wrong. Just support them. Just, just show them that you love them and you care for them. People need to feel supported and loved at this time whenever they've come so close to death. They need to know that, that you're in it with them. Number three, plan fun things that you will do together whenever you're feeling better. So, so when I was in the hospital, um, they, I had to limit the amount of fluids that I could drink, and this was really uncomfortable. Uh, I've never been so thirsty in my whole life. And so uh, I, I'll remember I was laying there, and my dad was sitting next to me, and we would talk at length about these hikes that we were going to go on together and these runs that we were going to do. And afterwards, we were going to get big old bottles of water and drink them together, and that would just feel so great. And we did it. A couple years after that, we got to go hike the uh, Kaibab Trail. Um, we went down into the Grand Canyon, and then we hiked back up. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Arizona, but it's very, very dry. So that water, it never tasted so good. People need to have fun things to look forward to uh, as they're doing that hard, hard work of healing. Number four, listen. Coming close to death will shake you to your very core. People who've come close to death are going to need time to talk about their hopes and their doubts, their fears, their frustrations, their dreams. And, you know, their priorities are really going to change. I mean, when you come close to death, you really think about, man, you know, how, how do I want to spend my life? Uh, you know, I've, every day is a blessing after that. And so if you can just be there to listen to them and to offer support as they go through this time of transformation and renewal, that, that is just so important. Listening is one of the best things that we can do for someone who's faced a near-death experience. And number five, pray together. My illness brought me closer to God than any other experience in my life until this point, and it had a profound impact on uh, the life of my family. They really grew in faith. My uncles, my parents, my grand, my grandparents, my brother, uh, their, their faith just grew so much in that time in the hospital. Healing, healing is more than the body getting better. Healing is the soul connecting to God and connecting to the people who love you. Praying together, even praying for someone who is unconscious, this can be a time for deep, deep growth in faith. So I want to say this. God does not cause our suffering but God sure is with us in our suffering. God really does show up. God shows up and provides healing. God is always healing. You know, that's, that's the nature of God. That's why there's so many stories of Jesus healing the sick. God is always healing. But what does healing look like? Well, it's, it's God healing the nations, healing communities, you know, communities that are pulled apart by difficulties in race relations, you know, history that's so much fighting. God is working to heal us as a world and as a people. God really did bring the Jews out of exile in Babylon, and God is working to heal our community here today. And God is working to heal us as individuals. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and God is working to bring healing into the lives of our brothers and our sisters. God is always with you, even after your body lays down for the last time. God is with you whenever you just feel so lost, whenever you lay your brother in the ground and he's there to stay. But God is with you whenever you praise God for joy because the brother that you thought was dead is now alive. God may not intervene in visible and miraculous ways. Sometimes, like the exiles in Babylon, we're called as a people to wait in patience and in hope. And sometimes, like Mary and Martha, we feel just lost and perplexed when it seems like, you know, Jesus just hasn't shown up. Where is He? Yet, just as God was with the people in exile, and just as Jesus mourned with Mary and Martha, so God is with us in ways that we may not always immediately perceive. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if Lazarus hadn't stood up and walked out of that cave? My near-death experience brought me closer to God than anything else. It brought my family 
closer together. Going so close to death and back brought me and my parents to a deeper faith in God's constant presence and love. But what would have happened if I hadn't stood up and walked out of that hospital bed? This is my hope and my prayer, that had the healing power of God not led to the cure of my body, that my life and my death would have led my parents to the same deep faith that they found whenever my body was cured. My prayer, like Jesus' prayer, is that my parents and my brother would have known the truth, that God really is with us. Amen.